In this presentation, we are going to take a look at 2 Nephi chapters 6 through 10 and what they teach us about Christ and his gospel and coming unto him. So let's begin with 2 Nephi chapter 6. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, Jacob taught with authority. Jacob taught with power and authority from God. He was called of God and ordained after the manner of his holy order, meaning received the holy priesthood and consecrated or set apart by his brother Nephi. In addition, Jacob employed three important elements of effective teaching as explained by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He said, quote, For I have exhorted you with all diligence, and I have taught you the words of my Father, and I have spoken unto you concerning all things which are written from the creation of the world. That is the formula by which the gospel has always been taught, a process used to this day, personal testimony, the teaching of living prophets, and the written record of the scriptures. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained what order of the priesthood the Nephites exercised. Quote, the Nephites were descendants of Joseph. Lehi discovered this when reading the brass place. Therefore, there were no Levites who accompanied Lehi to the Western Hemisphere. Under these conditions, the Nephites officiated by virtue of the Melchizedek priesthood from the days of Lehi to the days of the appearance of our Savior among them. End of quote. This phrase, his holy order, refers to the higher or Melchizedek priesthood. Anciently, this priesthood was called the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. But out of respect or reverence to the name of the supreme being, to avoid the too frequent repetition of his name, they, the church in ancient days, called that priesthood after Melchizedek or the Melchizedek priesthood. Where the priest of God is found, discipline and order will also will be found. Will be found also. The government of heaven is a government of order. The scriptural account of Melchizedek's ordination, for instance, states that he was ordained and high priest after the order of the covenant made with Enoch, it being after the order of the Son of God, which order came not by man nor the will of man, neither by father, father nor mother meaning he didn't receive it because of heritage, back to quote, it being after the order of the Son of God, which order came not by man nor the will of man, neither by father or mother, neither by beginning of days nor ends of years, but of God. And it was delivered unto men by the calling of his own voice, according to his own will, unto as many as would believe on his name. The thrust of all this is simply that with priesthood comes order. That part of the Book of Mormon that has been granted to us makes no special effort to detail church organization among the Nephites. This, however, gives no justification for the idea that organization, discipline, and order were missing. Where the priesthood is, they are also. Chapter 6, verses 4 through 18, Jacob recounts Jewish history. Jacob quoted from Isaiah to teach concerning things which are and which are to come. He applied Isaiah's teachings to his people because they were part of the house of Israel. These are some of the same verses that Nephi applied to the descendants of Lehi in the latter days. These applications of the same prophecy to different situations are examples of likening the scriptures under the influence of the Spirit. Chapter 6, verse 4, the phrase, These things which are and which are to come, the words of Isaiah, meaning, in the academic world where scholarship has displaced the spirit of revelation, it is argued that Isaiah could speak only of events pertaining to his own day, that his warnings are to be so interpreted. This is the reason why the world so tenaciously argues for a second Isaiah. They refuse to acknowledge that Isaiah could have known of future events described in his writings. Among the household of faith, the ceaseless tide of revealed truth wastes away such sandcastle theology.
we know that Isaiah wrote all of the book of Isaiah. Because that is clear, because Nephi quotes from all of the book of Isaiah and attributing it, or quotes from all different parts of Isaiah, from the first into the last chapters, and attributes it all to Isaiah. Chapter 6, verse 5, the phrase Isaiah spoke concerning all the house of Israel refers to Israel consists of 12 tribes, each with a promised destiny. To proclaim the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies based solely on the experience of some who represent one who represent but one of these tribes is to misunderstand the greatness of his vision. Bible prophecy is not fulfilled in what happens to the Jews alone, for Israel is more than the tribe of Judah. The phrase, many things, may be likened to us, meant many of Isaiah's prophecies find appropriate application among the Book of Mormon peoples to, to show that their experiences harmonize perfectly with the prophecies of Isaiah. However, it does not mean that these prophecies have been fulfilled. The Book of Mormon peoples are but a remnant of the house of Israel and the ancient prophecies can only partially be fulfilled in their experiences since the promises were given to all of Israel. Chapter 6, verse 6, the phrase, lift up my hand to the Gentiles, meant as a loving father stretches out his arms to embrace his children and draw them to his bosom so the Lord will reach after the Gentiles in the latter days. This phrase, lift up my hand, may also signify the Lord's lifting his right arm in covenant, stretching forth his hand to accomplish his work or perhaps reaching out to invite the Gentiles to come unto him. The phrase, set up my standard to the people, means the Lord's house is always one of order. As the newly formed nation of Israel journeyed from Egypt to Palestine, each tribe was assigned his position in the order of march and in the place of encampment. As ranks were formed, a representative of each tribe would raise a standard or a banner on a pole around which the tribes could rally and quickly find their place. This is talked about in Numbers chapter 2. This standard or ensign, which was the ancient rallying point for Israel, provides an excellent symbol for the gospel to which the lost and disordered tribes of Israel will return in the latter days. The promise that the Lord would again set up his standard among the people is the promise that the gospel will be restored and that Israel will rally to it. The scriptures define the standard of God's word, specifically the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi 29.2, the everlasting covenant, the great Zion of the last days, and the light of the righteous or the church and its faithful members. Overall, the standard is the true gospel and church of Jesus Christ. The phrase upon their shoulders means, as the gathering of Israel is both temporal and spiritual, as it embraces both a return to the saving truths of the gospel and a return in many instances to the lands of their inheritance, so the blessings of help and protection promised them will be both temporal and spiritual. The term Gentiles refers to Gentiles or all those who are not of, the, of Israel, with Israel being either the literal descendants of Jacob or those who have come spiritually unto the God of Jacob, which would, that would mean through baptism. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, the phrase, thy sons, thy daughters, kings and queens, referring to Nephi commented on Isaiah 49, 22-23, and 1 Nephi 22, 6-9, explaining that the Gentiles will bless his seed both temporally, meaning with physical nourishment, and spiritual, with spiritual nourishment, the gospel. Jacob cast a different light on this prophecy of Isaiah. In 2 Nephi 10, 5-9, he explains that when the Jews come to believe in Christ, they will be gathered in from their long dispersion. 
and the nation of the Gentiles shall be great in the eyes of me, saith God, in carrying them forth into the lands of their inheritance. Yea, the kings of the Gentiles shall be nursing fathers unto them, and their queens shall become nursing mothers. One interpretation of these words was given by Elder Spencer W. Kimball, referring to kings and queens being nursing fathers and nursing mothers. Quote, the brighter day has dawned. The scattering has been accomplished. The gathering is in process. May the Lord bless us all as we become nursing fathers and mothers. And unto, unto our Lamanite brethren, and hasten the fulfillment of the great promises made to them. The kings and queens may well be the righteous men and women who have entered into covenant of the fullness of the priesthood in the temple of God. If you remember, part of the endowment is to become kings and queens and priests and priests unto the Most High God. And so as missionaries go out having a temple endowment, we are sending kings and queens through the endowment of the temple, out to help gather Israel. Chapter 6, verse 7, bow, the phrase, bow down, face towards the earth, lick up the dust, these meant, in the ancient Near East, these actions were signs of submission to a king or ruler. In times past, Israel was repeatedly conquered and forced to submit to the kings of the earth. But in the last days, kings and queens will bow in obeisance and submission to the children of Israel. The phrase, not be ashamed, that wait for me, meaning those who wait for the Lord are those who trust patiently in his plan. Their faith will be vindicated. They will not be ashamed that they believe because all of God's promises are fulfilled. The psalmist said, O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Chapter 6, verse 8, the Babylonian captivity was at the time of Jacob's address a historical reality. The knowledge of this was granted them by revelation. Chapter 6, verse 9, the source of Jacob's revelation was an angel, undoubtedly a former prophet among the nation of Israel, who had sought to warn them of the calamities that awaited them. Now the message become, became, became one of hope. Israel would again attain the land of promise to them, and the Messiah would manifest himself to them. Unfortunately, they would also again return to wicked paths, rejecting and crucifying their master. The phrase Holy One of Israel referring to, this is one of many expressive name titles by which the Son of God is known. The name signifies that he is the embodiment of holiness and that he would come through the lineage of that chosen people. Chapter 6, verses 10 through 11, the rejection of their Messiah caused the southern kingdom or the nation of Judah to be scattered, smitten, and hated. Such was to be their lot until that time came when once again they come to the knowledge of their Redeemer, after which it is here promised it will be their right to return to their lands of their inheritance. It is well to remember that as the blessings of the Almighty are not the exclusive province of one tribe, neither are the cursings. Again, it would be short-sighted to suppose that this promise was fulfilled in the Jews alone. Repetitiously, we are told in the Book of Mormon that none have rights or promises to lands of inheritance until they have accepted Jesus as the Christ and accorded their lives with his teachings. The return of the Jews to the ancient land of Palestine and the creation of the state of Israel in 1948 constituted a marvelous foreshadowing of the fulfillment of prophecy. This did not match the vision of Book of Mormon prophets, however, who were insistent that the Jews must first return to Christ and accept the Holy One of Israel before they would have claim upon the covenants made with their ancient fathers. So the Jews that are gathering right now in Israel are of the house of Jacob. 
not of the house of Israel. To become a member of the house of Israel, that's the covenant name. So you must enter the covenant through the covenant of baptism. That's how you get the covenant name of Israel. Right now, we do not have covenant Israel Jews gathering in Israel, but we do have the tribe of Jews from the house of Jacob gathering. 6, chapter 6, verse 11, the phrase lands of their inheritance means Jacob wrote of lands of inheritance rather than a land of inheritance. It is reasonable to suppose that God has entered into special covenants with many to whom he has promised various lands as symbol of the future inheritance that will be theirs if they are faithful in keeping the covenants of this estate. Chapter 6, verse 12, they shall be saved, meaning a temporal rather than a spiritual salvation is spoken of in this verse. The promise extended to those who do not fight against Zion is not exaltation, but rather an assurance that they will not be destroyed when the wicked perish. Chapter 6, verse 13, the phrase, they who wait for him, referring to those of our day who wait his return. The Lord has said, Verily I say unto you, my friends, fear not, let your hearts be comforted, yea, rejoice evermore, and in everything give thanks, waiting patiently on the Lord, for your prayers have entered into the Lord ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, and are recorded with this seal and testimony. The Lord has sworn and decreed that they shall be granted. Therefore he giveth his promise unto you with an immutable covenant that they shall be fulfilled, and all things wherewith you have been afflicted shall work together for your good and for, to my name's glory, saith the Lord. The Lord will sustain and protect his own, and that are they who wait for him. Chapter 6, verse 14, the phrase, Messiah will set himself against the second time to recover them, means, in the broad sense, Israel has often been gathered. Christ sought unsuccessfully to bring all Israel together in his mortal ministry. He concluded his last preachment in their temple, saying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, now that killest the prophets and stonest them, which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. In a more specific sense, the scriptures speak of two occasions when Christ directed Moses to return and restore the keys of the gathering, first on the Mount of Transfiguration, second in the Curtain Temple. The phrase, the destruction of their enemies, refers to, in power and great glory, Christ will return to destroy the enemies of his people and to restore the kingdom of Israel. Chapter 6, verse 16, the phrase, the prey, mighty, and captives, has reference to. The context of 6.16 tells us that the prey, captives, refer to God's covenant people who are in bondage to the Gentiles. The mighty, called the terrible in verse 17, could also refer to Satan, who makes us his captives when we sin. The prey shall indeed be taken from the mighty, by God who is mightier than all. The phrase lawful captives refers to the description of being made captive by legal right may suggest that Israel was taken legitimately according to the rules of warfare, or that she is captive to Satan according to the law of justice. But in his mercy, God's claim to his children supersedes the claim of all others. Chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, Jacob, having announced that in his second coming Christ will recover Israel, quoted Isaiah's prophecy to that effect. From this oracle we learn that it will not be guns or planes or military strategy or battlefield courage that redeems Israel. Jesus the Christ will deliver and redeem his people, both temporally and spiritually. Chapter 6, verse 18, the phrases feed, own flesh, drunken, own blood, 
has reference to in 1 Nephi 23.13, Nephi tells us that in the last days the great and abominable church shall war among themselves, and the sword of their own hands shall fall upon their own heads, and they shall be drunken with their own blood. In the next verse, he explains that the same fate will befall every nation which shall war against thee, O house of Israel. They shall be turned one against another, that they shall fall into the pit which they dig to ensnare the people of the Lord. Scriptural instances of kingdoms that have turned against themselves include Egypt, Babylon, and, of course, the Jaredites. This term, or all flesh, this term may refer to all human beings— or even all members of the animal kingdom. Perhaps the Lord's manifestations of power will be so great that all creatures will know He is God. The phrase, Savior, Redeemer, Mighty One of Jacob, meaning these three titles of Jehovah signify His power to rescue and to succor us from His death and sin savior to ransom us and purchase us from the demands of justice redeemer and to deliver us from all of our enemies mighty one let's now go to second nephi chapter 7 which is quoting isaiah ch chapter 50 Commentaries for this chapter is taken mostly from Donald W Perry J A Perry and Tina M and Peterson in the book Understanding Isaiah. I put that up front just to let you know because I won't reference them every time. But a lot of the commentary comes from these three great Old Testament scholars. Chapter 7 1, the phrase put thee away, cast thee off means under Jewish law, husband separated from or divorced his wife by putting her away or casting her off. The Lord affirms that Israel has been put away, but it was Israel that turned away, not the Lord. The phrase, bill of your mother's divorcement, means, according to the law of Moses, a man could not divorce his wife without pretend, presenting her with a legal bill of divorcement. At one point, the Lord actually did separate himself from ancient Israel. As Jeremiah declared, quote, When all of the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorcement. End of Jeremiah's quote. Perhaps the Lord's reassurance here apply to latter-day Israel. The phrase creditors have I sold you means it was the custom in ancient Israel for some creditors to take the children of their debtors and sell them as slaves for payment of an overdue debt. But the Lord has no creditor. He is in debt to no one, and he has not sold Israel into slavery. Ultimate, God and Israel are separated because of Israel's choices, not God's. The phrase sold yourselves, put away, means the children of Israel have sold themselves into the bondage of sin, and the mother has been set aside or divorced because of unfaithfulness. Perhaps the children here represent the sons and daughters of the covenant, and perhaps the mother represents the nation of Israel as a whole. Chapter 7, verse 2, the phrase no man means when Jehovah came to apostate Israel, there was no one to receive him. Unfortunately, in every generation, there are fewer or even none to receive the Lord. The phrase I called none to answer refers to too many of Israel were like Amulek before he repented, said, I was called many times and I would not hear. The phrase hand shortened refers to the scriptures testify repeatedly of God stretching out his hand to deliver his people. His hand is indeed stretched out, not shortened or inadequate to save. Chapter 7, verse 2, the phrase dry up the sea, river, uh, rivers of wilderness, uh, wilderness, fish to stink, waters are dried up, clothe the heavens with blackness, means the Lord uses these as examples of his power. 
The phrases may refer to drought and to the smoke of war, which, although perpetuated by man, can also be a judgment of God that obscures the sky, and they remain, remind us of the miracles of Moses in Egypt. They may also refer not only to events of the past, but also to the second coming, an event of the future. The Lord gave the same prophecy through Jeremiah. Just as the Lord has great power over the elements, so also does he have power to redeem and deliver. Chapter 7, verse 3, the phrase, the words, heavens and blackness, referring to the dark sky heralds the coming judgments as well as Christ's second coming. As the Lord said in Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they... And then they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Perhaps earthquakes and volcanic activity in the last days will cover the heavens with blackness. Elder Bruce R. McConkie gave another interpretation, quote, I clothe the heavens with blackness, and there is no more revelation, thus saith our God. Such is his promise spoken prophetically of our day, and here given in modern times is his announcement that as he spake, so has it come to pass. Verily I say unto you, darkness covereth the earth, and gross darkness covereth the minds of the people, and all flesh has become corrupt before my face. End of Brother McConkie's quote. The word sackcloth, meaning sackcloth, is the clothing of mourning. Here, the darkness of the heavens may symbolize the mourning of the wicked at the second coming of Christ, or it may symbolize the mourning of the righteous and of heaven and of the heavens and earth. Chapter 7, verse 4, the phrase, tongue of the learned, know how to speak means the Lord has blessed the servant, who is the Messiah, with knowledge and eloquence. His speaking ability is in marked contrast to that of Enoch and Jeremiah. The phrase, speaketh a word in season, means the servant delivers the word of the Lord to those he serves. The Lord enables the servant to speak the right words at the right time. The phrase, weary, white Waketh morning by morning refers to though Israel would re rather slumber spiritually, the Lord repeatedly awakens her to his word of truth and righteousness. Or that he in this verse, or the he in this verse may refer to the servant rather than the Lord. As a contrasting interpretation, then the servant speaks to those who are weary because of the burdens of the world offering daily comfort and blessings. Contrast these verses with Isaiah 28, 11 through 12. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherein ye may cause the, rest, the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. The phrase, Why Waketh mine ear, the Lord speaks to the servant's responsive ear in continuing revelation. The phrase here as the learned refers to those who know the most are most able to learn more. Through gift, God's gift, the servant not only speaks as the learned, but do, but hear or learns as the learned do as well. Chapter 7, verse 5. The phrase, appointed mine ears, the Lord speaks to the servant, the Messiah, by revelation. The phrase, turned away back, turned away back, refers to the servant did not turn from his appointed mission, nor did he turn off the straight and narrow path. Chapter 7, verse 6, black, smiter, cheek, pluck off the hair. These refer to the servant, the Messiah, submitted himself to great insult for his testimony. The striking language calls to mind the physical suffering of our Lord. Beating on the back would seem also to be the custom in punishing evil men. In addition, the servant gave his cheek to those who pluck out the hair. 
The Oriental regarded the beard as a sign of freedom and respect, and to pluck out the hair of the beard, for the cheek in effect would refer to a beard, is to show utter contempt. So we don't have reference to it in the New Testament, but the Old Testament says that they would pluck off the hairs of Jesus. So that is missing out of the New Testament, that as they, he went through the scourging and all things, there was one point where they plucked off the hair of his beard. The phrase, hid not my face, means the servant did not try to hide or escape from punish, persecution. As Nephi wrote regarding Christ, and the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore they scourge him, and he suffer it. They smite him, and he suffer it. Yea, they spit on him, and he suffereth it, because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. Chapter 7, verse 7, the phrase, God will help and not be confounded, means the servant, the Messiah, knows that God will stand by him in his faithfulness, just as the Lord will stand by us if we are faithful. The phrase, set my face like a flint, means a sign of firmness or determination. In his determination, or I'm sorry, speaking of Jesus Christ, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, quote, the course of his life was towards the cross. He was steadfast and immovable in his determination to follow this very course, one laid out for him by his father. He had said of himself through the mouth of Isaiah, I set my face like a flint, and I know I shall not be ashamed. Clearly, there was to be no turning back. End of quote. Chapter 7, verse 7 through 8, not be ashamed, and Lord justifieth refers to the servant knows that the Lord will bring his prophecies to pass and will validate all he has done in his ministry. Chapter 7, verse 8, the phrase contend, stand together, adversary, come near, means in an ancient Middle Eastern civil court, the two opponents stood together to hear the judge's decision. In a criminal court, the accuser made the charge personally to the defendant. Here the servant is persecuted from all sides, but the Lord is near and he justifieth me. The phrase, strengthen my mouth, refers to God's words, whether directly or through his servants, have great power enabling the servant to overcome all his enemies. Chapter 7, verse 9, the phrase, wax old as a garment and moth shall eat them, refers to the servant's enemies will slowly but surely be destroyed, even as clothing is destroyed by time and pests. Chapter 7, verses 10 through 11, walking in the light of their own fire means Isaiah asked if any who fear and obey the Lord walk in darkness. The answer, of course, is no. He then stated those who walk in the light of their own fire and in the sparks they, which they have kindled shall lie down in sorrow. Many people in our day trust themselves or other people above the Lord. They rely on their own arm of their flesh and follow their own light rather than trusting in God. Hence, this expression refers to those who walk in their own way, according to their own will, rather than according to the will and direction of the Lord. The Lord's will comes to us through the Holy Ghost, which ministers truth as by fire. Speaking to the people of our dispensation, the Lord has said, They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God. The Savior is the light of the world. It is unwise for us to attempt to replace his light with the light that we have. President Joseph F. Smith warned against those who falsely teach using their own light when preaching, quote, false doctrines disguised as truths of the gospel. He said they are the proud and self-vaunting ones who read of the lamp of their own conceit, who interpret by rules of their own contriving, who have become a law unto themselves, and so pose as the sole judges of their own doings. End of quote. 
Thus, two classes of people are contrasted in these two verses. One class consists of those who fear the Lord and obey his servant. They will not walk in spiritual darkness, but will have spiritual light. The other class consists of those who seek to be spiritually self-sufficient, relying on themselves instead of on God. They attempt to create their own light, but their efforts produce no more than sparks when compared to the bright light that comes from God. Those in this group will eventually receive judgments from the Lord, resulting in sorrow. We now go to chapter 8 of 2 Nephi, which is um, quoting of Isaiah 51 and 52 verses 1 through 2. Commenting on this chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah 50, Jacob said, O oh, that cunning plan of the evil one, O oh, the vainness and the frailties and the foolishness of men. When they are learned, they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsel of God, for they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. Second Nephi chapter 8 verses 1 through 8. In Second Nephi 8 1 is a call to those who follow after righteousness. The call is repeated again and again. Hearken, verse 1, look, 1 and verse 2, hearken again in verse 4, lift up your eyes in verse 6, and again hearken in verse 7. The call reminds the righteous of their origins, Abraham and Sarah, and the blessings they received. Even as Abraham and Sarah received promises when fulfillment seemed beyond hope, so will the Lord fulfill his promise to comfort Zion, verse 3. He will change the area of Palestine physically, verse 3, and he will give the people a spirit of joy and gladness. That's also verse 3. The head note to this chapter in the LDS edition of the Bible clearly places these events in the last days. In the last days, then, Zion will be established and blessed. Verse 3. God's law will go forth from her. 8 verse 4. And his righteousness will dwell there. Verse 5. His judgments will punish the wicked and bless the righteous. Verses 4 and 5. When Christ comes, ushering in the millennium, the heavens and the earth as we know them will be destroyed, as will the wicked. But the Lord's promises to the faithful will never end. That's verse 6. A recurring theme is the idea of righteousness and salvation. These two words appear eight times in this passage. In verse 1 and 7, the Lord indicates that he is speaking to those who seek righteousness. In verses 5, 6, and 8, he says that his righteousness is near, that it will not be abolished, and that it lasts forever. Likewise, he tells us that his salvation has gone forth, and that it is forever, and that it lasts from generation to generation. That seems to be a reminder of the principle of grace. Our righteousness is insufficient, but if we will turn to the Lord, we can partake of his righteousness, which enables us to attain the blessings we seek. That's what grace means, enabling power. Christ, Christ, Christ grace enables us to do in those things which we are not capable of doing on our own. Righteousness means to choose the good and godly way of life, to follow our God in all things. Salvation refers to deliverance from our enemies. In fact, deliverance from all our enemies is the very definition of salvation, according to the prophet Joseph Smith. Elder Bruce R. McConkie has commented on verses 4 to 6 of this passage, quote, we hear a divine voice acclaim, Hearken unto me, my people, and the Latter-day Saints are the Lord's people. And give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. Thanks be to God that law now has come. It is the fullness of his everlasting gospel. By it he will judge the world, and it now stands as a light for all men. My righteousness is near. The millennial day is almost upon us. 
My salvation has gone forth. The gospel is being preached to prepare a people for the coming day. Hence, lift up your eyes to the heavens, O ye saints of the Most High, and look upon the earth beneath. Read the signs of the times, the signs now being shown forth in the heavens above and the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. This old world shall never die. There shall be a new heaven and a new earth. It will be a millennial earth, and my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished, saith the Lord. End of Elder McConkie's quote. Second Nephi chapter 8 verses 9 through 16 the Lord has reminded Israel that all his promises will be fulfilled and that Zion will be established now the people who follow after righteousness cry unto the Lord for assurance that he will indeed bring the promised blessings awake the people cry to the Lord reminding him of the power he has shown forth in earlier days he would he wounded the dragon and dried the sea. Just as he helped the children of Israel escape from Egypt through the Red Sea, they testify, so will he bring latter-day redeemed ones back to Zion with songs of joy and gladness. Verse 11. The Lord answers by reminding them of the weakness of man who is like unto grass. Verse 12. And of the power of God who is stretched forth the heavens verse 13 the people of zion have been fearful of their oppressors verse 13 forgetting that the lord is god of all the armies or hosts of heaven verse 15 zion is my people and the lord will care for them verse 16 in second nephi 8 17 through 23 and 24 through 25 the preceding passage begin, passage begin with Israel calling on the Lord to awaken and fulfill his promises. In this passage, the Lord calls on Jerusalem, or the people of Israel, to awake from their spiritual slumber and turn from their sins that have brought the Lord's fierce anger. Verse 17, the people have become so wicked that there is none to guide her among all her sons. Verse 18. But the Lord will send two sons to help her. Two prophets will be raised up unto the Jews at the last day. Verse 19. They shall come in a time of desolation and destruction by famine and sorrow and the sword. Verse 19. Though all others among the Jews have failed her. Verse 20. These two will act in great power. Isaiah 51.10. Israel has become drunken by partaking of the Lord's punishment for her sins, but the Lord will remove the cup of his fury from her, sparing her people in his mercy. Chapter 8, verse 22. That same cup will be given to them that afflict thee. Verse 23. Again, the Lord calls Jerusalem to awake to return to priesthood power. Thy strength, which Joseph Smith explained this expression by saying that Isaiah had reference to those whom God should call in the last days, who should hold the power of the priesthood to bring again Zion and the redemption of Israel, and to put on her strength, is to put on the authority of the priesthood, which she, Zion, has a right to by lineage, also to return to that power which she has lost and put on beautiful garments, referring to temple covenants, and no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean, meaning being temple worthy. Verse 24, Israel is to place her slave, replace her slave garments with beautiful garments, perhaps the garments of royalty or the holy garments of the temple. One of the ways in which Zion puts on her beautiful garments is through the law of consecration. She is invited to arise from the dust and sit down in a position of glory. The bands of her neck are the curses of God upon her, or the remnants of Israel in their scattered condition among the Gentiles. 
These are images of Israel coming forth from both physical and spiritual slavery. The Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi 8, 24-25 combines the first two verses of Isaiah 52 with the entirety of Isaiah 51. Isaiah 52, 1-2 is quoted or paraphrased in pre three places in the Book of Mormon by Jacob in 2 Nephi 8, 24-25, by the Savior in 3 Nephi 20, 36-37, and by Moroni in Moroni 10, 31. Jesus explained that the fulfillment of these verses would come after the Jews were gathered to Jerusalem in the last days. After reading Isaiah 51, or 2 Nephi 8, and Isaiah 52, 1-2, through 2, or 2 Nephi 8, 24-20, that should be 25, I apologize. Let's change that there. Through 25, Jacob said, And now, my beloved brethren, I have read these things that ye may know concerning the covenants that of the Lord, that he has covenant with all the house of Israel, that he has spoken unto the Jews by the mouth of his holy prophets, even from the beginning, down from generation to generation, until the time comes that they shall be restored to the true church and fold of God, when they shall be gathered home to the lands of their inheritance, and shall be established in their lands of promise. Behold, my beloved brethren, I speak unto you these things, that ye may rejoice and lift up your heads forever because of the blessings which the Lord God shall bestow upon his children. We now go to chapter two or chapter nine of Second Nephi. This is probably one of, if not the greatest chapter and treatise on the plan of salvation, and is a little lengthy. But there seems to be no other chapters that compares in doctrine of the plan of salvation than this does. Second Nephi 9, an introduction. We all know someone who has died. Thankfully, knowledge of Heavenly Father's gospel plan offers us peace in the midst of deep sadness. The Book of Mormon prophet Jacob taught of the great blessings of the atonement by describing what would happen to our body and our spirit had there been no atonement. Jacob testified of the greatness of God, who prepared a way for our salvation. He described how the Savior tenderly comforts, pleads for, and redeems Israel. By accepting and following the Lord's commandments, we place ourselves in a position to receive His promised blessings. 2 Nephi chapter 9, 1-3, the phrase, Rejoice forever in the atonement refers to, Elder Jeffrey All Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that Christ and his atonement should be at the heart of our rejoicings. Jacob's testimony was that the mighty God will always deliver his covenant people, and that the mighty God is, by his own declaration, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer and Mighty One of Jacob. Jacob reflected on such teachings, especially those contained in the writings of Isaiah, so that his current audience and future readers might know concerning the covenants of the Lord that he has covenanted with all the house of Israel, giving the parents of every generation cause to rejoice and to lift up their heads forever because of the blessings which the Lord shall bestow upon their children. At the heart of that covenant and the reason for such rejoicing is the atoning sacrifice of the mighty God, who is the Savior and Redeemer of the world. Chapter 9, verse 3, the phrase, Blessings upon your children. Beyond the assurance of their own salvation, there is no greater promise that God can grant the righteous than to bless their posterity. The greatest joys of the gospel center in the family, for salvation, meaning exaltation, consists of the continuation of the family unit in eternity. Chapter 9, verse 4, the phrase, Ye have searched much to know of things to come, referring to, The Lord God is merciful and gracious, eager to reward the faithful with knowledge and power. There are no secrets he will not make known, no mysteries he will not reveal as soon as the saints are able to bear them. The things of eternity are to be known, 
Indeed, all things from the days of old and for all ages to come will be unveiled unto those who love the Lord and seek to acquire His virtues. These blessings are granted, however, only to those who search much. Chapter 9, verse 4, the phrase, Ye know that in our bodies we shall see God, is means, the doctrine of the resurrection is as old as the world. It was first taught by Father Adam. From creation's dawn it was known and understood that in time's meridian the sinless one would take a tabernacle of clay, would go forth among the people working mighty miracles, would teach and train and ordain and organize a church, would suffer and bleed in a garden and on a cross for the sins of mankind, and would die and be buried in a tomb, and would be raised in glorious immortality, spirit and body, becoming an inseparable whole, never again to be divided. This, the central paramount event in all eternity, was known by the people of God in all ages. Resurrection was not an idea created by mystical Jews, was not a notion that evolved out of the Babylonian captivity, and was not a doctrine given birth by Jesus and thus known first in the meridian of time. It was anticipated by Adam and Enoch and Noah. It stirred the hopes of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. It was taught by Moses, Isaiah, and Elijah. And of course, as part of the gospel dispensation, enjoyed by the Lehite colony. It was expounded upon by Lehi and Nephi and Jacob. Lehi no doubt knew of the doctrine before he left Jerusalem and taught it to his family. The doctrine of the resurrection was undoubtedly taught with great plainness in the brass plates. Chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, the phrase, Atonement central to the merciful plan. The first presidency in Quorum of the Twelve Apostles declared to the world the central role of the Savior and his divine influence on all mankind. We offer, quote, we offer our testimony of the reality of his matchless life and of his infinite virtue of his great atoning sacrifice. None other has had so profound influence upon who have lived and will yet live upon the earth. He was the great Jehovah of the Old Testament, the Messiah of the New. He instituted the sacrament as a reminder of his great atoning sacrifice. He was arrested and condemned on sp spurious charges, convicted to satisfy a mob, and sentenced to die on Calvary's cross. He gave his life to atone for the sins of all mankind. His was a great vicarious gift in behalf of all who would ever live upon the earth. We solemnly testify that he lives, which is central to all human history, neither began in Bethlehem nor concluded on Calvary. He was the firstborn of the Father, the only begotten of the Son in the flesh, the Redeemer of the world. End of quote. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency declared the importance for understanding the power of the Atonement. Quote, our salvation depends on believing in and accepting the atonement. Such acceptance requires a continual effort to understand it more fully. The atonement advances our moral course of learning by making it possible for our natures to become perfect. Any increase in our understanding of his atoning sacrifice draws us closer to him. Literally, the atonement means to be at one with him. The nature of the atonement and its effects is so infinite, so unfathomable, and so profound that it lies beyond the knowledge and comprehension of mortal man. We long for the ultimate blessing of the atonement, to become one with him, to be in his divine presence, to be called individually by name as he warmly welcomes us home with a radiant smile, beckoning us with open arms to be enfolded in his boundless love. How gloriously sublime this experience will be if we can feel worthy enough to be in his presence. The free gift of his great atoning sacrifice for each of us is the only way we can be exalted enough to stand before him and see him face to face. The overwhelming message of the atonement is the perfect love the Savior has for each and all of us. It is love which is full of mercy, patience, grace, 
equity, long-suffering, and above all, forgiving. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 5, the phrase, subject unto man, that all men might become subject unto him, means modern revelation speaks of our Lord as he that ascended up on high, as also he descended below all things, and that he comprehendeth all things, that he might be in and through all things the light of truth. Christ's rise to the throne of exaltation was preceded by his descent below all things. Only by submitting to the powers of demons and death and hell could he, in the resurrection, serve as our exemplar of a saved being, one who had placed all things beneath his feet. I am Alpha and Omega, he said, Christ the Lord. Yea, even I am he, the beginning and the end, the Redeemer of the world. I have accomplished and finished the will of him whose I am, even the Father, concerning me. Having done this, that I might subdue all things unto myself, retaining all power, even to the destroying of Satan and his work at the end of the world and the last great day of judgment. Chapter 9, verse 6, the phrase, Death hath passed upon all to fulfill the merciful plan, refers to life, death, to the Latter-day Saints, the two are not so much opposites as they are points on the eternal spectrum. Birth and death are inextricably intertwined, the words being defined in terms of one another. We are born to die and die to live. Life's darkest reality is death. Death is the common lot of all mankind. This is in spite of the earthly status and accomplishments. Every man or woman is born and every man or woman shall die. All are born as helpless infants, and all are equally helpless in the face of death. It was not intended that any be spared the experience of death, for that would deny them the eternal happiness that can only come in the resurrection. Chapter 9, verse 6, the phrase, the resurrection must needs come by reason of the fall, referring to the fall of Adam brought both temporal and spiritual death into the world. The atonement of Christ abolished death and hath brought eternal life and immortality to, the, to light through the gospel. Adam brought death while Christ brought life. Adam is the father of mortality, Christ the father of immortality. Chapter 9, verse 6, the phrase, The fall came by reason of transgression refers to Adam's partaking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, of the fruit of the tree, not, not three, sorry for that. Fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is properly referred to was a transgression, not a sin. Transgression in this instance centers our attention on a broken law rather than on willful disobedience. See, the law was if you wanted to stay in the garden forever, then you couldn't take partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But if you wanted to further the plan and have children and become like God, then you eat the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. So that's all he was doing was breaking the law of being being able to stay in the Garden of Eden. They chose to further the plan. Joseph Smith taught that Adam did not commit a sin in eating the fruit, for God had decreed that he should eat and fall. The fall of man came as a blessing in disguise. Joseph Fielding Smith explained, and was the means of furthering the purposes of the Lord in the progress of man, rather than a means of hindering them. I never speak of the part Eve took in this fall as a sin, nor do I accuse Adam of a sin. Jacob's words sound very much like his father's words taken from the blast plates, which account is remarkably close to the language restored through Joseph Smith in his inspired translation of Genesis. 
I give unto you a commandment, God said to Adam, to teach these things freely unto your children, saying that by reason of transgression cometh the fall, which fall bringeth death, and as much as you are born into the world by water and blood and the spirit which I have made, and so become of dust a living soul, even so you must be born again into the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 9, verse 6, the phrase, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. Meaning, once again, from the prophet's translation of Genesis, we read, we read that after the fall, Adam and Eve, his wife, called upon the name of the Lord, and they heard his voice of the Lord from the way towards the Garden of Eden, speaking unto them. And they saw him not, for they were shut out of his presence. That was the law, if you partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which furthered the plan. In a modern revelation, we learn that the devil tempted Adam and he partook of the forbidden fruit and transgressed the commandment wherein he becomes subject to the will of the devil because he yielded unto temptation. Meaning, in other words, he's now mortal and he is subject to temptation. Wherefore, I, the Lord God, caused that he would be cast out from the Garden of Eden from my presence because of his transgression wherein he became spiritually dead. To experience spiritual death is to be removed from the presence of God and to die as to things pertaining to righteousness. Chapter 9, verse 7, The Infinite Atonement. L. Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explains several ways in which the atonement is infinite. Quote, His atonement is infinite without an end. It is timeless, embracing past, present, and future. It was also infinite in that all humankind would be saved from a never-ending death. It was infinite in terms of his immense suffering. It was infinite in time, putting an end to the preceding prototype of animal sacrifice. It was infinite in scope. It was to be done once for all. And the mercy of the atonement extends not only to an infinite number of people, but also to an infinite number of worlds created by him. God said to Moses, and by the word of my power have I created them, which is mine only begotten Son, who is full of grace and truth, and worlds without number have I created. And I also created them for mine own purpose, and by the Son I created them, which is my only begotten. And then, in discussing the role of the Son in the redemption and glorification of these words, their passing away, the divine word continued, but only an account of this earth I give unto the inhabitants thereof, give I unto you. For behold, there are many worlds that have passed away by my word of my power, and there are many that now stand, and innumerable are they unto man. But all things are numbered unto me, for they are mine, and I know them. It was infinite beyond any human scale of measurement or mortal comprehension. Jesus was the only one who could offer such an infinite atonement since he was born of a mortal mother and an immortal father. Because of that unique birthright, Jesus was an infinite being. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 7, the phrase that must needs be an infinite atonement. Our Savior is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and the effects of his atonement reach back to Eden and forward to the millennium's end. Adam and Eve were taught to call upon God in the name of the Son for remission of their sins by virtue of an atonement which would be worked out some 4,000 years hence. The light of the atonement must shine upon all who were previously shadowed by the effects of the fall. An infinite atonement must bring life to all that is subject to death. The suffering and sacrifice in Gethsemane and on Golgotha were undertaken by a being who was greater than man, one possessing the powers of a god. This was no human sacrifice, nor even simply an act of a wise and all-loving teacher. It was more, infinitely more, than an example of submission or a model of humanitarianism. He did for us what no other being could do. Yes, it is true that there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in.
But it is equally true that what Jesus of Nazareth accomplished in and through the awful atonement is beyond human comprehension. It is the work of an infinite personage. Indeed, as Amalek later proclaimed, there is not any man, meaning a man subject to the perils of death, that can sacrifice his own blood which will atone for the sins of another. Therefore, he concluded, there can be nothing which is short of an infinite atonement which will suffice for the sins of the world, even a great and last sacrifice to be undertaken by the Son of God, yea, infinite and eternal. Chapter 9, verse 7, the phrase, this corruption could not put on incorruption, means if there were no atonement and thus no infinite power by which to bring about the resurrection from the dead, then man would be without the hope of Job when he said, In my flesh shall I see God. We shall all be changed, Paul assured us, in a moment in a twinkling of eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible body must put on incorruption and this mortal body must be put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 7, the phrase, the first judgment must have remained, means, had there been no atonement, then the command of God to Adam in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die, would have taken effect and endured endlessly. Man would have been a slave in the world of spirits, unable to know the fullness of joy that comes only in the resurrected state. Chapter 8. 8, 9, verse 8, the phrase, if the flesh dries no more, our spirits must become subject to the devil. Why would it be that one would remain forever subject to Satan in the spirit world if there had been no resurrection? Would this also be true of a good man, one who had lived a life of, more, of morality and decency? Jacob's testimony was firm and his doctrine sound. Had Christ not risen from the dead, we would all spend eternity in hell and eventually become servants to the father of lies. The resurrection was the proof of our Lord's divine sonship. The outward evidence that he was all he and his anointed servants said he was, the Messiah. If Jesus did not have the power to rise from the tomb, power to save the body, he did not have power to save the soul, the power to forgive sins. Even the sinless cannot save themselves. For example, even if it were possible that little children could sin, they could not be saved if no atonement had been made. But in fact, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Had Christ not interceded on our behalf, no person, great or small, would have qualified for a kingdom of glory. No unclean, king, no unclean thing can enter into the kingdom of God. Therefore nothing entereth into his rest, declared the Savior to the Nephites, save it be those who have washed their garments in my blood because of their faith and the repentance of all their sins and their faithfulness unto the end. In Paul's language, if Christ be not risen, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written, quote, Our spirits, stained with sin, unable to cleanse themselves, would be subject to the author of sin everlastingly. We would be followers of Satan. We would be his, we would be sons of perdition. End of quote. If the resurrection to the dead be not an important point or item in our faith, Joseph Smith pointed out, we must confess that we know nothing about it. For if there be no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not risen. And if Christ has not risen, he was not the Son of God. And if he was not, and if he, and if he was not the Son of God, there is not nor cannot be a Son of God. If the present book called the scriptures is true, because the time has gone by when, according to that book, he was to make his appearance, and if he has risen from the dead, he will by his power bring all men to stand before him. 
For if he has risen from the dead, the bands of temporal death are broken, that the grave has no victory. If then the grave has no victory, those who keep the sayings of Jesus and obey his teachings have not only a promise of a resurrection from the dead, but an assurance of being admitted into his glorious kingdom. Chapter 9, verse 9, the phrase, Who transformeth himself nigh into an angel of light, refers to Satan is the master of deception, and will you decide, will you, you utilize any guise necessary to accomplish his purposes? He will appear as an angel of light, that is, an angel of God. Those who walk by the light of the Spirit and rely upon the power of the Lord are able to discern and distinguish between the God of glory and the God of this world. Chapter 9, verse 10, the phrase, Oh, how great the goodness of our God. President Gordon B. Hinckley expressed gratitude for the Savior's role in fulfilling the atonement. Thanks be to God for the wonder and the majesty of his eternal plan. Thank and, glorif thank and glorify his beloved Son, who with indescribable suffering gave his life on Calvary's cross to pay the debt of mortal sin. He it was who, through his atoning sacrifice, broke the bonds of death and with pow godly power rose triumphant from the tomb. He is our Redeemer, the Redeemer of all mankind. He is the Savior of the world. He is the Son of God, the author of our salvation. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 10, the phrase, Escape from the grasp of this awful monster. Through the plan of the Father, the gospel of God, an avenue of escape from the perils of mortality is provided. Christ's atonement provides deliverance from both death and hell. The phrase death, hell, death of the spirit, meaning by death, Jacob meant the separation of the body and the spirit. Hell thus becomes the abode of ignorant and unclean spirits. By death of the spirit or spiritual death was meant man's separation from God and the things of righteousness. Chapter 9, verses 11 through 12. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. In the resurrection, the grave will release the physical bodies, and the disembodied will be released from the spirit world, the world of spirits. In a way incomprehensible to man, the effects of the resurrection of our Maker, called in the scriptures the first fruits of the resurrection, will pass upon all. All who have taken a body in mortality, whether demonic or saintly in character, will be lifted up by the power of the Lamb of God in immortality. Those who have received and obeyed the divine word being raised unto eternal life. Chapter 9, verse 13, the phrase, the paradise of God. Paradise is the abode of the righteous in the world of spirits. It is the place to which the disembodied Savior went and preached the gospel to an innumerable company of spirits of the just. Here he organized a missionary force sufficient to carry the message of light to those who were thus in the darkness of hell. Chapter 9, verse 13, the phrase, All men become incorruptible and immortal, meaning all who inherit a kingdom of glory will enter those kingdoms with a whole and physical, perfect physical body, clean and free from the taints of sin. Full payment for his every sin will have been made by the unrepentant sinner, even the uttermost farthing paid. Joseph Smith stated, All will be raised in the resurrection by the power of God, having spirit in their bodies and not blood. The resurrected body will be incorruptible, whole, complete, pure, no longer subject to aging, sickness, and decay. Indeed, to possess the gift of immortality is to have the power to live forever, the capacity to endure every obstacle of life. The scriptures speak expressly of immortality as one of the wondrous gifts of man through the atonement of Jesus Christ. And yet we recognize that the spirit of man is already an immortal entity, a conscious personality which cannot cease to exist. Even if there had been no atonement, the spirit of man would live on everlastingly. 
but the immortality of which the scriptures almost always speak is that immortality associated with the immortal soul or resurrected body, the inseparable union of the body and the spirit equipped uh, thereafter for a kingdom of glory. Only through the actions of a God, the redemptive labors of Jesus Christ the Messiah, can such an immortal state be attained. Chapter 9, verse 13, the phrase, they are living souls, means Jacob here provided a strict definition of the soul, spirit, and body united, one consistent with that given in modern revelation, and the spirit and the body are the soul of man. In virtually every other instance, the scriptures speak of the soul of man as equal with his spirit. Chapter 9, verse 14, the phrase, have a perfect knowledge. This verse has no reference to gaining a fullness of knowledge in and after the resurrection. We will not know all things at the time of our resurrection, but we will come to know things as God knows them in due time. In the words of Joseph Smith, omniscience is not to be had immediately at death or even at the time of our rise from death. It is not all to be comprehended in this world. It will be a great work to learn our salvation and exaltation even beyond the grave. This verse refers instead to knowledge of what a person has done with his mortal life, how he has lived in relation to the commandments of God. Each person's knowledge of his life, good or bad, will be perfect at the time he is raised from the dead. We cannot hide anything from ourselves or rationalize or anything or rationalize or hide anything from God. We will have a perfect knowledge of all that we did in our life. Facades or cover-ups or denials will be no more. We will see as we are seen, known as we are known, and acknowledge before the tribunal of deity that his ways are just. For those who have wasted the days of their, their probation, this time of judgment will be a moment of singular encounter and confrontation. For those who have been wise in the use of their time and talents, this occasion will be a moment of sublime, sublime joy and accomplishment. In short, this is the occasion whereon one's book of life is opened and the story is read. Chapter 9, verse 14, the phrase, the robe of righteousness, meaning, let us be glad and rejoice, the revelator wrote, and give horror to God, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, the church, hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. I think instead of horror, that should be honor. And give honor. I apologize for not catching that mistake. The prophet Joseph pleaded in his dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple that the kingdom which thou hast set up without hands may become a great mountain and fill the whole earth, that thy church may come forth out of wilderness of darkness and shine forth fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. Continuing, the prophet implored that when the trump shall sound for the dead, we shall be caught up in the cloud to meet thee, that we may ever be with the Lord, that our garments may be pure, that we may be clothed upon with robes of righteousness, with palms in our hands and crowns of glory upon our heads, and reap eternal joy for all our sufferings. If we have on the robes of righteousness, then that means our sins have been covered and cannot be declared and God remembers them no more. The robe of righteousness is also a covering for sins. Jesus is talking to the multitude about John the Baptist. Jesus, in talking to the multitude about John the Baptist, said, Why is it that ye receive not the preaching of him whom God has sent? 
If you receive not this in your heart, you receive not me. And if you receive not me, you receive not him whom I am sent to bear record. And for your sins, you have no cloak. We want our sins to be covered, brothers and sisters. And even as David also describeth the blessedness of man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgotten and whose sins are covered. Also, wherefore, we shall have a perfect knowledge of all our guilt and our uncleanliness and our nakedness. And the righteous shall have a perfect knowledge of their enjoyment and their righteousness, being clothed with purity, yea, even with the robes of righteousness. This seems to indicate that sin and stains of sin remain. And the only way to get rid of them is to have them covered by the robes of righteousness. Chapter 9, verse 15, the phrase, they must appear before the Holy One of Israel, refers to, the resurrection precedes the final judgment. In a sense, this judgment is a formality so far as concerns assigning persons to their respective kingdoms of glory. All who have endured mortality will be resurrected, but they will come forth with different kinds of bodies, some celestial, some terrestrial, some telestial, and some with bodies incapable of enduring any degree of glory. The body we receive in the resurrection determines the glory we receive in the kingdoms that are prepared. The reality is that there will be a whole hierarchy of judges who under Christ shall judge the righteous. He alone shall issue the decrees of damnation for the wicked. Chapter 9, verse 16, the phrase, They who are righteous shall be righteous still, refers to Amalek's testimony that that same spirit which doth possess your body at the time you go out of this life will have power to possess your body in that eternal world is a positive for the righteous as it is a negative for the wicked. That I to say, those who leave this world loving truth and seeking righteousness will continue with those same desires in the world of spirits among the persons of like dispositions. They will, according to the law of restoration, come forth from the grave quickened with celestial glory, a portion of which they enjoy immortality as they chose to abide by a celestial law. In the words of Jacob, they shall be righteous still. Verse 16, the phrase, they who are filthy shall be filthy still. The resurrection does not change one's disposition, nor does it alter one's spiritual directions. One who was honorable and moral on earth, but not valiant in the testimony of Jesus, shall rise to a terrestrial glory. One who lived a telestial existence on earth, who lived after the ways of the world, shall reap as he sowed. Moroni taught that because of the redemption of man which came by Jesus Christ, men are brought back into the presence of the Lord, yea, this is wherein all men are redeemed, because the death of Christ bringeth to pass the resurrection. And then cometh the judgment of the Holy One upon them, and then cometh the time that he that is filthy shall be filthy still, and he that is righteous shall be righteous still. He that is happy shall be happy still, and he that is unhappy shall be unhappy still. There is no magic dust in death, brothers and sisters. You don't all of a sudden grain a whole bunch of faith just because you die and your spirit continues to live in the spirit world. Like it says, whatever disposition you die with, if you have the disposition to live the gospel, then you'll have that in the spirit world. If you had a disposition to live after the man of the world, when you die, you won't automatically have your eyes opened. No, you will still have the disposition to live after the manner of the world. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the final judgment and condition of cleanliness we must achieve. Quote, Many Bible modern scriptures speak of a final judgment of which all persons will be rewarded according to their deeds or works or the desire of their hearts. But other scriptures enlarge upon this by referring to our being judged by the conditions we have achieved. 
The prophet Nephi described the final judgment in terms of what we have become. And if their works have been filthy in us, they must needs be filthy. And if they be filthy, it must needs be they cannot dwell in the kingdom of God. Moroni declares, he that is filthy shall be filthy still, and he that is righteous shall be righteous still. The same would be true of selfishness or disobedience or any other personal attribute inconsistent with the requirements of God. Referring to the state of the wicked in the final judgment, Alma explains that if we are condemned by our words, our works, and our thoughts, we shall not be found spotless, and in this awful state we shall stand not we shall stand not dare to look upon to look up our God. President Gordon B. Hinckley used the example of pornography to teach the same principle when he said, Let any who may be in the grips of this great vice get on their knees in the privacy of their closet and plead with the Lord for help to free from this evil monster. Otherwise, this vicious stain will continue through life and even into eternity. Jacob, the brother of Nephi, taught, and it shall come to pass that when all men shall have passed from first death unto life, inasmuch as they have become immortal, they who are righteous shall be righteous still, and they who are filthy shall be filthy still. Chapter number 16, a phrase, a lake of fire and brimstone. King Benjamin taught that if a man does not repent in this life, the demands of divine justice doth awaken his immortal soul to live a lively sense of his own guilt, which doth cause him to shrink from the presence of the Lord, and doth fill his breast with guilt and pain and anguish, which is like an unquenchable fire, whose flame ascendeth up for ever and ever. With the exception of the sons of perdition, all men will come forth in the resurrection to a kingdom of glory. All except those vessels of wrath will pay the othermost farthing in hell and be delivered through the resurrection. Hell or outer darkness has limits and duration, at least for those who qualify for the telestial kingdom. The Lord frequently utilizes terms such as endless torment or eternal damnation from phrases which are more expressed than other scriptures than it might work upon the hearts of the children of men. For all but the sons of perdition, hell comes to an end at the time of the resurrection of the unjust. In speaking of the lake of fire and brimstone associated with the state of mind of one in hell, Joseph Smith taught, quote, A man is his own tormentor and his own condemner. Hence the saying, they shall go into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man is as exquisite as a lake burning with fire and brimstone. I say, so is the torment of man. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 17, the phrase, O oh, the greatness and the injustice, I'm sorry, O oh, the greatness and the justice of our God. Without the idea of the existence of the attribute of justice and deity, Joseph Smith declared, men could not have confidence sufficient to place themselves under his guidance and direction, for they would be filled with fear and doubt, lest the judge of all the earth would not do right. And thus fear or doubt existing in mind would preclude the possibility of the exercise of faith in him for life and salvation. Ours is the God of Jacob, one upon whom we can depend with perfect confidence. The arm of flesh, though often well intended, grows weak under the weight of life's vicissitudes and is often misdirected. Where man is capricious, God is steadfast. Where man is myopic in vision, God sees and knows all. Only when the knowledge is perfect can the justice be perfect. Verse 17, the phrase, he executeth all his words, referring to what I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my words shall not pass away, but all shall be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of the servant, it is the same. I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say, but when you do not what I say, ye have no promise. Chapter 9, verse 18, the phrase, They who have endured the crosses of the world. Taking up the cross of the gospel of discipleship is associated with forsaking the ways of the world and centering one's life in Christ. 
Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if, man, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And now for a man to take up his cross is to deny himself all ungodliness and every worldly lust and keep my commandments. In addition, those who have endured the cross of the world and despised the shame of it are those who have learned to ignore the jeerings of doubters and whose eyes single to the glory of God never stray from the course charted by their captain. They care precious little for the acclaim of those who worship the world, and they seek only that life which is sanctifying and that praise which is heaven sent. Like Lehi, these disciples have partaken of the fruit of the tree of life, are aware of the scoffings and enticements of those in the great and spacious building, but have heeded them not. In verse 18, the phrase, the kingdom <clears throat> which was prepared from the foundation of the world, <clears throat> referring to eternal life, was continually promised to the faithful in pre-mortality. I'm sorry, the eternal life was conditionally promised to the faithful in pre-mortality. The conditions were that they would be required to come to earth, join, join the Lord's church, receive the ordinance of salvation, and be obedient to the Lord's commandments, yielding to the enticings of the Holy Spirit throughout their lives. As they did this, that calling and election to eternal life granted to them in pre-mortality would be made sure. Predestination, or the unconditional election of individuals to eternal life, is a false doctrine and has never been taught by the Lord or his authorized servants. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, suggested a meaning for the word crosses. Quote, what are the crosses of the world? We cannot be sure, but the imagery suggests that the bearing of a cross placed upon us by the world, as Jesus did, there may be persecutors and unhelpful onlookers, and the church member is set apart, if not set upon. Yet he does not flinch when accused and scoffed at by those who would make him ashamed, for he has no real reason to be ashamed. Chapter 9, verse 20, the phrase, God knoweth all things. The lectures on faith teach why the omniscience of God is necessary. Without the knowledge of all things, God would not be able to save any portion of his creatures. For it is by reason of the knowledge which he has of all things from the beginning to the end that enables him to give that understanding to his creatures by which they are made partakers of eternal life. And if it were not for the idea existing in the minds of men that God had all knowledge, it would be impossible for them to exercise faith in him. Elder Neil A. Maxwell explained that God must know all things in order to accomplish his work to bring to pass our immortality and eternal life. Quote, those who try to qualify God's omniscience fail to understand that he has no need to avoid ennui meaning tedium, by learning new things. Because God's love is also perfect, there is in fact divine delight in that one eternal round, which to us seems to be all routine and repetition. God derives his great and continuing joy and glory by increasing and advancing his creations, and not from new intellectual experiences." There is a vast difference, therefore, between an omniscient God and the false notion that God is on some sort of postdoctoral fellowship, still searching for additional key truths and vital data. With a later so, God might at any moment discover something true not previously known to him. That would restructure, diminish, or undercut certain truths previously known by him. Prophecy would be mere prediction. Planning assumptions pertaining to our redemption would need to be, re be revised. Fortunately for us, however, his plan of salvation is constantly underway, not constantly under revision. In a very real sense, all we need to know is that God knows all. End of quote. What a great doctrine and quote by Brother 
Maxwell. Hiram Smith, the patriarch, taught simply, Our Savior is competent to save all from death and hell. I can prove it out of the revelation. I would not serve a God that did not have all wisdom and all power. I wouldn't either. How, how could I put my trust in the, someone that does not have all wisdom and all power? In commenting upon these words of his grandfather, Joseph Fiddling Smith observed, Do we believe that God has all wisdom? If so, in that he is absolute. If there is something he does not know, then he is not absolute in wisdom. And to think of such a thing is absurd. Does he have all power? If so, then there is nothing in which he lacks. If he is lacking in wisdom and in power, then he is not supreme. And there must be something greater than he is. And this is absurd. The notion that our God is still progressing in knowledge, that he is gaining new truths, seems to have come from a faulty interpretation of the Prophet Joseph Smith's King Follett sermon and a misunderstanding of what is meant by eternal progression. God progresses in the sense that his kingdoms expand and his dominions multiply. Joseph Smith describes our Father's progression in the King Follett sermon. Speaking as Christ might speak, the prophet said, I do the things I saw my father do when worlds came rolling into existence. My father worked out his kingdom with fear and trembling, and I must do the same when I get my kingdom. I must present it to my father so that he may obtain kingdom upon kingdom, and it will exalt him in glory. He will then take a higher exaltation, and I will take his place, and thereby become exalted myself. The prophet therefore concluded, So that Jesus treads in the tracks of his Father and inherits what God did before, and God is thus glorified and exalted in salvation and exaltation of all his children. The idea that God progresses in any manner other than through the exaltation of his children is without scriptural support. I believe what God I believe that God knows all things, President Joseph Fielding Smith testified, and that his understanding is perfect, not relative. I have never seen or heard of any revealed fact to the contrary. I believe that our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus Christ are perfect. I offer no excuse for the simplicity of my faith. Chapter 9, verse 21. He suffereth the pains of all men. Elder James E. Talmage, in an attempt to describe the awfulness of the atoning hours in Gethsemane, has written, quote, Christ's agony in the garden is unfathomable by the finite mind, both as to the intensity and the cause, and the thought that he suffered through fear of death is untenable. Death to him was preliminary to resurrection and triumphal return to the Father whom he had come, and to a state of glory even beyond what he had bef before possessed, and moreover, it was within his power to lay down his life voluntarily. He struggled and groaned under a burden such as no other being who has ever lived on earth might ever conceive as possible. It was not physical pain nor mental anguish alone that caused him to suffer such torture as to produce an excursion of blood from every pore, but a spiritual agony of soul such as only God was capable of experiencing. No other man, however great his powers of physical or mental endurance, could have suffered so, in some manner actual and terribly real, though to man incomprehensible, the Savior took upon himself the burden of sins of mankind from Adam to the end of the world. End of quote. President Brigham Young spoke of the extent of the Savior's efforts to save mankind. Quote, this is the plan of salvation. Jesus will never cease his work until all are brought up to the enjoyment of a kingdom in the mansions of his Father, where there are many kingdoms of men and glories to suit the works and faithfulness of all men that have lived on the earth. Some will obey a celestial law and receive of its glory. Some will abide the terrestrial and some the telestial. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 22, the phrase that all might stand before him. 
First comes the resurrection, then the final judgment. All men and women will stand with bodies of flesh and bones before the Holy One of Israel. There they will await the divine decree whereby he who sees and knows all things coincides each person, except sons of perdition, to an appropriate kingdom of glory. Samuel the Lamanite thus taught a sinful generation. For behold, Christ must sure, surely must die that salvation may come. Yea, it behooveth him and becometh expedient that he br die, dieth to bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, that thereby men might be brought into the presence of the Lord. Chapter 9, verse 23, the phrase, Repent and be baptized in his name. Baptism is the first fruits of repentance, the evidence of one's desire to serve the Lord and take upon himself the name of Christ. Through baptism, we covenant by an ordinance rich in symbolism to participate in the atonement of Christ by remembering his death, burial, and rise to life. Verse 25, the phrase, where there is no law given, there is no punishment, means... There is but one gospel law, and it is by that law that all men must be judged. Our God is just and merciful. When we are given a law, where, whenever opportunities for obedience are made available, the Almighty expects us to be true to those divine directives. When, however, adequate opportunities for understanding are not available to us through circumstances beyond our control, <coughs> Excuse me. God will hold us guiltless in regard to the law until a time when a compliance is possible. The law of justification thus demands that all who are saved in the celestial kingdom must have conformed to the laws requisite for entrance into that kingdom. None will so attain under false pretense. For all who will have a blessing at my hand shall abide the law which was appointed for that blessing and the conditions of their love, as were instituted from before the foundation of the world. The law of justification also serves that no person in all eternity will be punished for disobedience to a law of which he or she was ignorant. No child of God will be eternally disadvantaged for non-compliance with a principle or for non-observance of an ordinance of which he or she had no knowledge. In short, there is not a soul who will be deprived of the opportunity for all of the blessings of exaltation because of the fullness of the gospel law was not to be had during this mortal sojourn. Joseph Smith learned by revelation, for example, that all who have died without a knowledge of the gospel, who would have received it if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. Also, all that die henceforth without a knowledge of it, who would have received it with all their hearts, shall be heirs of that kingdom. And then the Lord explained the basis of this principle, the foundation stone upon which the law of justice rests, the very essence of the reason why the Latter-day Saints devote themselves unceasingly to the labor in behalf of their dead. For I, the Lord, will judge all men according to their works, according to the desire of their hearts. In Alma's words, it is requisite with the justice of God that men should be judged according to the works. And if the works were good in this life, and the desire of their hearts were good, that they should also at the last day be restored unto that which is good. That's why we have teaching in the spirit world for those who, out of no fault of their own, did not have adequate opportunity to hear the gospel and adhere to the ordinances thereof. Elder Dallin H. Holt speaks of the, this principle as follows. When someone generally wanted to do something for my father-in-law but was prevented by circumstances, he would say, Thank you. I will take the good will for the deed. Similarly, I believe that our Father in Heaven will receive the true desire of our hearts as substitute for actions that are genuinely impossible. Not those actions that we rationalize, but those that are genuinely impossible. That was me saying that. Here is now uh, continuing Elder Oaks' quote. Here we see another contrast between the laws of God and the laws of men. It is entirely impractical to grant a legal advantage on the basis of an intent not translated into action. 
I intended to sign that contract or we intended to get married cannot stand as the equivalent of the act required by law. If the law were to give effect to intentions in lieu of specific acts, it would open the door for too much abuse, since the laws of man have no reliable means of determining our innermost thoughts. In contrast, the law of God can reward a righteous desire, because an omniscient God can discern it. As revealed through the prophet of this dispensation, God is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. If a person refrains from a particular act because he is genuinely unable to form it, but truly would if he could, our Heavenly Father will know this and can reward that person accordingly. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 26, the phrase, Upon all those who have not the law. A marvelous internal evidence of the verity of the gospel, one not found in the th theologies of men, is the manner in which it reaches out to embrace all who have not had the opportunity to embrace its teachings and participate in its ordinances in this life. An angel taught King Benjamin that Christ's blood atones for the sins of those who have fallen by the transgression of Adam, who have died not knowing the will of God concerning them, or who have ignorantly sinned. Mormon likewise declared that the power of redemption cometh on all them that have no law. Thus, one of the unconditional benefits of the atonement is the protection and deliverance from the demands of God's justice for those who did not have access to the fullness of the gospel law. In verse 26, the phrase that God who gave them breath, the Holy One of Israel, refers to Jesus Christ, assisted by a host of noble and great ones, acting under the direction of Elohim, his Father, was the creator of the worlds without number. When Christ speaks of man's creation, he is speaking in behalf of the Father. When it came to placing man on earth, as Bruce McConkie has written, there was a change in creators. That is, the Father himself became personally involved. All things were created by the Son, using the power delegated by the Father, except man. In the Spirit, and again in the flesh, man was created by the Father. There was no delegation of authority where the crowning creatures, creature of creation was concerned. Verse 27, the phrase, wasteth the day of his probation, refers to, We lived an infinitely long period of time in the premortal existence. There we developed talents, ap aptitudes, and ca capacities which would bless us in this, the second estate. We who are blessed with membership in the church pass many tests in that pristine estate, proved true and faithful to the Father's plan, and merited a calling or election, including the assurance that we would ta tabernacle the flesh through a chosen lineage, the house of Israel, which would facilitate our reception of observance of gospel laws. Much longing and waiting, much preparation and planning, much testing and trying were undertaken and accomplished before we ever came here. We now stand on center stage in the eternal drama. By modern revelation, we know where we came from, why we are here, and the possibilities held out to us by the Father concerning life hereafter. We are now in the final phase of our probation, to some degree the most critical phase. In the words of Amulek, if we do not improve our time, that is, grow in the likeness of God, while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness when there can be no labor performed. Chapter 9, verses 28 through 29, nothing could be more serious for a finite man, limited in his grasp of eternal things, and thus stilted in his views of things as they really are, than to assume that he knows what is best for himself, and to turn a deaf ear to the voice of God. Joseph F. Smith said, quote, Among Latter-day Saints, the preaching of false doctrine disguised as truths of the gospel may be expected from people of two classes, and particularly from these only. They are, first, the hopelessly ignorant, those lack of intelligence is due to their indolence and sloth, who make but feeble effort, if indeed any at all, to better themselves by reading and study, and those who are afflicted with a dreaded disease that may develop into an incurable malady, laziness. Second, 
the proud and self-vaunting ones who read by the lamp of their own conceit, who interpret by rules of their own contriving, who have become a law unto themselves, and so pose as he or she judges of their own doings, more dangerously ignorant than the first. Thus, among the stairs of the evil one are the vanity of knowledge and the vanity of ignorance, the intelligently obese suffering themselves with spiritual junk food and the spiritually anorexic refusing all nourishment. Those who trust in the arm of flesh have an unnatural reliance upon the theories and philosophies of men. Those who study and trust the revelations of God cherish the declarations of living oracles. We have no right, counseled Elder Orson F. Whitney, who was an apostle of the Quorum of the Twelve, to take the theories of men, however scholarly, however learned, and set them up as a standard and try to make the gospel bow down to them, making of them an iron bedstead upon which gospel truths, if not long enough, must be stretched out, and if too long, must be chopped off. Anything to make it fit within the system of man's thoughts and of theories. On the contrary, we should hold up the gospel as the standard of truth and measure thereby the theories and opinions of men. What God has revealed, what the prophets have spoken, what the servants of the Lord proclaim when inspired by the Holy Ghost can be dependent upon, for these are the utterances of a spirit that cannot be and does not make mistakes, while the teachings of men are often based upon sophistry and founded upon false reasoning. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 28, the phrase, The Cunning Plan of the Evil One. This is reference, the devil is a shrewd manager of machinations. He seeks with clever persuasion to convince men to be independent of heaven's God, to trust in earth's wealth rather than heaven's treasures, in man's intellect rather than in God's intelligence. In verse 28, the phrase, the vainness of men, meaning man's vanity finds expression in good causes for bad reasons in public alms given rather than in private acts of charity. Such were the immodest fashions of honors and accolades tailored by men, rather than the comely, com, comely robes of righteousness bequeathed the saints of God. The saints of God. Verse 28, the phrase, when they are learned, they think they are wise, meaning to be wise is to apply one's heart to understanding. Wisdom is the righteous application of knowledge for the blessing of oneself and others. Wisdom is a gift of the Spirit and granted by God. The wise among us know the source of all that is good, and we trust in Him. Those doing otherwise come short of the glory of God, will never obtain a fullness of the truth. President Gordon B. Hinckley described the weakness of trusting intellect over faith. The intellect is not the only source of knowledge. There is a promise given under the inspiration of the Almighty set forth in these beautiful words, God shall give unto you knowledge by his Holy Spirit, yea, by the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost. The humanist who criticizes us, the so-called intellectual who demean us, speak only from ignorance of their manifestation. They have not heard the voice of the Spirit. They have not heard it because they have not sought after it and prepared themselves to be worthy of it. Then, supposing that knowledge comes only of reasoning and the workings of the mind, they deny that which comes by the power of the Holy Ghost. Do not be trapped by their sophistry of the world, which for the most part is negative and which seldom if ever bears good fruit. Do not be ensnared by those clever ones whose self-appointed mission is to demean that which is sacred, to emphasize human weakness and undermine faith rather than inspire strength. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 29, the phrase to be learned is good if they hearken. The Holy Ghost, sorry, that's Holy Ghost, not Holly. The Holy Ghost works upon the mind and heart of one who is humble and submissive, bringing things to his remembrance and teaching him the truth of all things. All are commanded to seek learning by study and also by faith. 
verse 30, the phrase, woe unto the rich, means the love of money, not money itself, is the root of all evil. Indeed, it is impossible for the those who trust in their riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at Joseph Smith's translation of Mark 10 through verse 26. Such persons are guilty of idolatry. They place other gods, in this case worldly prosperity, before the worship of Jehovah. It was the master himself that taught us to beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Verse 30, the phrase, because they are rich, they despise the poor. Those trusting in riches despise the poor, often because those in poverty serve as a reminder of their obligation to share their wealth with those in need. The gospel of Jesus Christ is against class distinction. That's why those who trust in their riches will never enter the kingdom of heaven. God never said that those who are rich will never make it. Those who trust in their riches and trust after the manner of the world, those are the ones. Chapter 30 phrase, they persecute the meek. The meek, those who are humble, teachable, and who demonstrate poise under provocations, such are an affront to one who has no control over his appetites for the things of the world. Verse 30, the phrase, their hearts are upon their the treasures Meaning, lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and, and the rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay upon yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and wherein thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Verse 30, the phrase, their treasures shall perish with them also. Meaning, worldly riches are fleeting, slippery, and hard to hold. Like those who seek them, corruptible treasures will not be allowed through celestial customs. Chapter 9, verse 31, the phrase, Woe unto the death that will not hear. Those who refuse to hear the voice of the Lord or the voice of his servants, those who give no heed to the prophets and apostles of their day, shall be cut off from the blessings available to the attentive and the obedient. Verse 32, the phrase, Woe unto the blind. The worldly and all things in it stand as evidence of our God. He who refuses to see the hand of God in all things is indeed blind, not only to the glories of God, but also to the glories that could be his. Verse 33, the phrase, Woe unto the uncircumcised of heart, meaning those who have put on Christ are expected to put off the natural man, to be circumcised as of heart is to have cut away the impediments that bring impurity. It is to yield one's heart to God. It is the source of eternal life. Verse 34, the phrase, woe unto the liar. The God of truth hates a lying tongue. Lying is the language of hell. Those who speak this tongue are the servants of the father of all lies, and such prepare themselves for citizenship in his kingdom. A covenant people cannot be a lying people, for lying breeds mistrust, fosters evil, poisons love, and in short, impoverishes all that is good. In verse 34, the phrase, he shall be thrust down to hell, meaning there will be no liars in the celestial kingdom. Unrepentant liars will be ushered into hell, outer darkness, at the time of death, and shall come forth in the resurrection to inherit the telestial kingdom. Wherefore, I, the Lord, has said that the fearful and the unbelieving and all liars, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, and the whoremongers and the sorcerers will have their part in that lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Verily I say that they have no part in the first resurrection. Of this category of men, the Lord declared, These are they who suffer the wrath of God on earth. Further, these are they who suffered the vengeance of eternal fire at the time of the Savior's coming, as well as in the spirit world. Finally, these are they who are cast down to hell and suffer the wrath of the Almighty God until the fullness of time when Christ will have subdued all enemies under his feet. President James E. Faust explained the meaning of telling the truth. We believe in being honest. We need we all need to know what it means to be honest. Honesty is more than not lying. 
It is truth-telling, truth-speaking, truth-living, and truth-loving. Honesty is a moral compass to guide us in our lives. Honesty is a principle, and we have our moral agency to determine how we will apply this principle. We have the agency to make choices, but ultimately we will be accountable for each choice we make. We may deceive others, but there is one we will never deceive. From the Book of Mormon we learn, the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. And there is none other way, save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. There are different shades of telling, truth-telling. When we tell little white lies, we become progressively colorblind. It is better to remain silent than to mislead. The degree to which each of us tells the whole truth and nothing but the truth depends on our conscience. As President Gordon B. Hinckley has said, let the truth be taught by example and precept that to steal is evil, that to cheat is wrong, that to lie is a reproach to anyone who indulges in it. End of President Faust's quote. Verse 35, the phrase, Woe unto the murderer who deliberately killeth. Premeditated murder is a sin unto death, meaning one of which there is no forgiveness. No murderer hath life abiding in him, John thought. A murderer, Joseph Smith explained, is one that sheds innocent blood and cannot have forgiveness. Thou shalt not kill, a modern revelation declares, but he that killeth shall die. Murder is thus a sin unto death, wrote Elder Bruce R. McCosty. McConkey, at least concerning members of the church to whom this revelation, which is entitled the law of the church, was addressed. We do know that there are murders committed by Gentiles for which they at least can repent, be baptized, and receive a remission of their sins. Verse 37, the phrase, Woe unto those that worship idols. Whenever a person places his affection and desires upon anything other than the true and living God, whenever one's devotion and loyalty and trust is centered in any person or object other than the Lord and his kingdom, whenever the claim and applause of men take precedence over the approval of God, then that man is guilty of idolatry. Not all idols are made of wood and stone. Some of the prominent idols of this day include academic degrees, letters and titles, careers and offices, social standings, fashions, and false feelings of desire for fulfillment. Verse 37, the phrase, the devil of all devils delighteth in them, meaning Satan, known also as Beelzebub, is the devil of all devils, the master of malevolence, the prince of perversion. Those guilty of idolatry have joined themselves to the congregation of devils. These are they who have made themselves in his image, who share in the darkness of his countenance. They have given themselves over to worship of Lucifer and his pos pos possessions in time. They still they seal themselves to the diabolical one. Verse 38, the phrase, they shall return to God. People do not return directly to the presence of God at death, but go into the world of spirits directly to await the resurrection, at which time they prepare to see God face to face. Verse 38, the phrase, remain in their sins. The sinner takes his disposition and nature with him into the spirit world. All men take the works of their lives with them through the veil of death. Thus the wicked remain in their sins at the time of death. Their nature will in course of time be changed through repentance, which they must suffer. Even those who come forth to the telestial resurrection will be clean from their sins. Verses 39 through 40. In harmony with the law of the harvest, the eternal decree that man reaps according to that which he sows, men are, or women are largely a product of their thoughts. What we think about determines what we are and what we become. If we think evil thoughts, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, our tongues will utter unclean sayings. If we speak words of wickedness, we will end up doing the works of wickedness. If our minds are centered on carnality and evil of the world, then worldliness and unrighteousness will seem to it to be the natural way of life. If we ponder things related to sex and 
morality in our minds, we will soon think everybody is immoral and unclean. And if we break down the barrier between us, and it will break down the, between, the barrier between us and the world. And so with every other wholesome, unwholesome, unclean, impure, ungodly course. And so it is that God says he hates and esteems as an abomination and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. On the other hand, if we are pondering our hearts the things of righteousness, we shall become righteous. If we virtue garnish, if we if virtue garnishes our thoughts unceasingly, our confidence shall act strong in the presence of God, and He will in turn rain down righteousness upon us. In discerning the character of one who shall dwell with the devouring fire, who shall dwell in everlasting burnings, that is, one who will qualify for exalt. Isaiah said that such one that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands hold, from holding off, holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. Uh, I I don't know if I've duplicated something here. We've done this one. She'll run high. In order, in order to qualify to go where God and angels are, man must take an affirmative and wholesome approach to life and worldly conditions. This in spite of eroding values and an ever-growing avalanche of evil. In Paul's language, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those who are carnally minded hate the truth, for the truth condemns their actions, actions which are untrue to all that is good and proper. Those who are spiritually minded, those who treasure up in their minds continually the words of life, enjoy the peace and assurance of the Spirit here and qualify for that life which is eternal hereafter. Verses 41 through 43, the phrase, Christ is the keeper of the gate. Final judgment rests with him unto whom the Father hath committed all judgment, even Jesus Christ. He stands at the gate or entrance into the presence of the Father into the celestial kingdom. Only he who is able to read and know the thoughts and intents of our hearts is capable of rendering perfect judgment. It is impossible to deceive the Holy One of Israel. President James U. Faust discussed the value of knowing that one day we will stand before the Savior to account for our lives. Quote, I recall a study some years ago that was made to determine what influences keep young people moving on the straight and narrow track. Of course, there were several critical influences. All were important. They include the influence of parent, priesthood advisors, young women advisors, scoutmasters, and peer association. But I was surprised to find that one golden thread of singular importance ran through this study. It was the belief that one day each of us would have to account for our actions to the Lord. Many believe that the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employs no servant there. And there is none other way, save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. Those who had an eternal perspective had an eternal amount of spiritual strength and resolve. Feeling our personal accountability to the Savior for our action and stewardships and responding to it provide a profound spiritual protection. End of quote. Elder Neil A. Maxwell describing a reassuring aspect to the principle that Jesus himself and no other will be the final judge, quote, said, Jacob in 2 Nephi 9.41, in speaking of the straight and narrow, reminds us that the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and that Jesus employeth no servant there. The emphasis rightly is on the fact that Jesus cannot be deceived. 
there is none other dimension of reassurance, too. Not only will the ultimate judgment not be delegated in order to serve the purpose of divine justice, but also divine mercy can best be applied by him who knows these things what only he can know. The quiet moments of courage in the lives of his flock, the unnoticed acts of Christian service, the unspoken thoughts which can be credited in no other way except through perfect judgment. End of quote. Elder Max will further explain the self-assigned gatekeeper is Jesus Christ, who awaits us out of a deep divine desire to welcome us as much as to certify us. Hence, he employeth no servant there. If we acknowledge him now, he will lovingly acknowledge and gladly admit us then. Verse 2, the phrase, they that are puffed up. The Book of Mormon contains a special warning to the learned and the wealthy to beware of pride. The self-sufficiency often associated with learning and wealth can dull sensitivity to the promptings of heaven and the pleas of fellow men. Indeed, it is impossible for those who trust in their riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Just after the Savior said, it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, then adds, with men that trust in riches, it is impossible, but not impossible with men who trust in God and leave all for my sake. For with such things, all things are possible. So those who are rich but trust in God can still make it. It's those who trust in their riches, it is impossible to enter the kingdom of God. In verse 42, the phrase, consider themselves full, refers to humility, is the beginning of true faith. It consists in realizing of one's strengths and weaknesses, an awareness that through Christ, one's personal infirmities and weaknesses can be identified and conquered, and that only through a reliance upon the merits of the Master can weak things be transformed into strengths. A realization of one's dependency upon the, the divine is essential to retaining a remission of sins from day to day. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of the world, of this world, is foolishness with God. Verse 44, the phrase, I take off my garments and I shake them. He means, having borne a powerful and persuasive testimony of the Savior and of the requirements of Christ's Christian discipleship, Jacob affirmed his innocence from sin before the people. He attested that his prophetic duty was done. He had warned, and now the people were under obligation to obey or be damned. In symbolic fashion, Jacob stated that his garments were clean of the sins of the people. As their spiritual leader, he had performed his duty to teach the truth, and to call him to repentance. The burden had now been shifted to those who had heard his witness. As he observed later in his own record, we did magnify our office unto the Lord, taking upon us the responsibility, answering the sins of the people upon our own heads, if we did not teach them the word of God with all diligence, whereby, wherefore, by laboring with all our might, their blood might not come upon our garments. In like fashion, all who would be saved must have lived and testified so that their garments are clean, also clean from the blood and sins of their generation. In verse 44, the phrase, his all-searching eye, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Nothing can be hid from the eyes of the Lord. Since the omniscient God searches the souls of all, no unclean thing can enter his presence. The symbol of the all-searching eye is thus closely associated with the temple, where men and women are made ready to enter the divine realm. Jacob's heart was pure. His desires for righteousness were genuine, and he knew it. He had confidence that God knew it. He had no secrets from the Lord. His soul was an open book. Jacob possessed perfect faith. He had total and complete confidence in the God of his salvation, the assurance that the course he had pursued was pleasing to that God. In a revelation to the saints, in this dispensation, the Lord declared, Verily I say unto you, among all them members of the church, 
who know their hearts are honest and are broken and their spirits contrite and are willing to observe their covenants by sacrifice, yea, every sacrifice which I, the Lord, shall command, they are accepted of me. Such can rejoice that God has seen their works. Verse 44, the phrase, I am rid of your blood, <clears throat> meaning leaders in the church who permit sin and iniquity to go unchecked for whatever reason, be it timidity or misplaced compassion, and who allow supposed mercy to rob justice, will bear the burdens of those sins themselves. Jacob stated that he was rid of their blood, meaning he had violently raised the warning voice and was innocent of their sins and free from their iniquities. Verse 45, the phrase, shake off the chains of him that would bind you fast. The chains of Satan, those with which he binds mankind into servitude and slavery, are forged through such links of apathy, ignorance of the things of eternity, false doctrine, and sin. Any the seer beheld Satan. He had a great chain in his hand, and it veiled the whole face of the earth with darkness and he looked up and laughed and his angels rejoice brothers and sisters why would you ever do anything or worship anything that laughs because of sin and wickedness satan just laughs what makes you think he will take care of you in any meaning of the word if you become one of his Verse 46, the phrase, justice shall be administered unto the righteous, meaning most discussions of justice stress the negative, that justice will one day be meted out to the wicked ungodly. Of this there can be no doubt. Of equal importance, however, is the fact that rewards and blessings without measure will be extended to the faithful at the time of the final judgment. The obedient also are entitled to their just reward. Verse 46, the phrase, remember your awful guilt in perfectness. See the commentary on verse 14. We talked about remembering our guilt in perfectness. And if you, <clears throat> the phrase in verse 46, the devil hath obtained me. See the commentary on verse 37. We talked about becoming sealed to Satan if there was no resurrection and God had not performed the atonement. Chapter verses 47 through 48, verse 47, the word of the Lord and the blessings of heaven come according to spiritual readiness. God is merciful and kind as well as wise. He does not give that for which we are either unworthy or ill-prepared. God grants that which we are ready to receive. Verse 48, to those who have stripped themselves of jealousies and fears and have humbled themselves before him, those who have an eye single to the divine glory, he grants the privilege of seeing his face. To those who continue to wrestle with priorities, those who attempt to keep one foot in Zion and one in Babylon, he speaks through his appointed messengers of sin and its consequences. When the people of God are holy, the Lord speaks of holy and sacred manners. When they are sinful, he speaks of awfulness of sin and the necessity of repentance. I think about that a couple of conferences ago, that the first talk that President Nelson gave was on abuse, sex abuse, any kind of abuse, physical abuse, that the abuse in the church needs to stop. What does that tell you? That that was the first words out of his mouth in that particular conference that we are guilty of abuse and we need to stop it and knock it off. He did not talk about sacred and holy matters because there is evidently a, a, a major problem according to Heavenly Father that he spoke to, through his prophets of abuse that is happening in this church. Chapter 9, verse 49, the verse, My soul abhors sin. The Holy Ghost is a sanctifier. One of the primary assignments of this member of the Godhead is to burn dross and iniquity out of the repentant soul as though by fire. One who lives worthy of the guidance and cleansing influence of the Spirit will, in process of time, become sanctified. 
Sanctification is the process whereby one comes to hate the worldliness he once loved and love the holiness and righteousness he once hated. To be sanctified is not only to be free from sin, but also to be free from the effects of sin, free from sin, sinfulness itself, the very desire to sin. One who is sanctified comes to look upon sin with abhorrence. Verse 49, the phrase, I will praise thy holy name of my God, refers to the faithful among the Lord's people, those above all who know whence their blessings come, should rejoice in the Lord and praise his name endlessly. For his goodness and grace, cries of Hosanna should ascend from the lips of the saints continually into the ears of the Lord of Savaot, or that means the Lord of hosts. The knowledge that there is a God in heaven who is infinite, concerned with his children, that there is a literal Savior who has brought, bought us with his blood, that prophets and apostles again walk the earth, the knowledge of these mighty verities should cause a welling up of eternal gratitude within the soul of all who can or ought to be called Latter-day Saints. Ours should be a ceaseless praise to him who dwells on high. Verses 50 through 51, Jacob again quoted Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 2, this time concerning the availability of gospel blessings. When the Old Testament or the Book of Mormon prophets declared that salvation is free, they were declaring the same doctrine that others of the prophets have called salvation by grace. Jacob implored all people, all that thirst for happiness, that thirst for peace, that thirst for the assurance of eternal reward and glory, hereafter, to come to the waters of life, to the true church, to God's legal administrators. He warned them against laboring in causes of doubtful worth and questionable productivity, so far as eternal things are concerned, against spending time and resources in pursuit of false Christ, false systems of religion, against needless giving all that a person has to support enterprises which will not satisfy when he could give himself to the true cause of Christ. Jacob encouraged his listeners to come unto the Holy One of Israel. Israel. For he that cometh unto Christ shall never hunger nor thirst. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained what it meant to buy without money. Quote, salvation is available to all men, not just a select few. Eternal life is not reserved for apostles and prophets, for the saints in Enoch's day, or for the martyrs of the Christian dispensation. All mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. God is no respecter of person. He inviteth them all to come to him and partake of his goodness, and he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, and he remembereth the heathen and all that are like unto God, both Jew and Gentile. The eternal call of the eternal God is, O oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price, for salvation is free. Verse 53, the phrase, according to the flesh. These promises are not to be understood as being figurative or metaphorically. They are to find a literal fulfillment in the lives of Lehi's descendants. That is quite a discussion on the plan of salvation, isn't it, brothers and sisters? And quite comprehensive and probably should be studied quite often. We now go to our last chapter, 2 Nephi chapter 10. Verse 2, our, the phrase, our children shall be restored, means by revelation Jacob had learned that the descendants of Lehi, after a long apostasy, are destined to become a rich, righteous branch in the house of Israel. At the conclusion of one sermon and in the introduction of another, he foretold of a future day when they will come again to the knowledge of Christ and be restored to his church. Verse 3, the phrase, Christ should be his name means critics of the Book of Mormon have raised two objections to this verse. First, since Christ is understood to be a title, meaning the anointed one, we are told that it would not have been given by an angel as a proper name. And second, because Christ is the anglicized form of the Greek Christos, it could not have appeared in any ancient record purportedly found in the Americas. 
Neither objection is well founded. To the first, it ought to be observed that though Christ is properly a title, it has in common usage become a proper name. Indeed, dictionaries list it as a proper noun, and many Christians would be surprised to learn that it was a title rather than a proper name. A great many words descriptive of status have, in like manner, come to be used as names. Examples are king, bishop, hunter, tailor, cooper, baker, etc. Even among his contemporaries, Jesus was known as Christ. For instance, Mark refers to him as Christ, the king of Israel. As to the Greek Christos being found on the gold plates from which the Book of Mormon came, is of course was not. What the ancient Nephite equivalent was, we do not know. Since the Book of Mormon was translated into English by Joseph Smith, he obviously used the English equivalent of the Nephite word, which is Christ. The title Christ was referred to Jacob by an angel. Christ, a Greek word, and Messiah, a Hebrew word, meaning the anointed. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the Father in the Spirit. He is the only begotten of the Father in the flesh. He is Jehovah, and was foregained to this great calling before the creation of the world. Under the direction of the Father, Jesus created the earth and everything on it. So we see Messiah, Hebrew, Greek, Christ, English, anointed one, and Hebrew, Joshua, in Greek, is Jesus, and in English, Savior. Chapter 10, verse 3, the phrase, they shall crucify him. Jacob was not, on the, fir Jacob was not the first to announce the death of the Son of God by crucifixion. Enoch had seen the Son of Man lifted upon the cross, as had Zenich, whose words were had by the Nephites. Such knowledge could only have been had by revelation. The fulfillment of the prophecies require not only that the Jews reject and kill their Messiah, but that he should die by crucifixion. The prophecy was more remarkable because crucifixion was unknown to Hebrew law. The Mosaic Code prescribed the penalty of death in four forms, stoning, burning, beheading, and strangling. Thus, the strange alliance in the death of Christ between the leaders of the Jews who condemned him to death and the Romans who carried out their sentence. Although crucifixion was one of the most excruciating and cruel forms of death ever devised, it was not original with the Roman Empire, though the Romans certainly perfected its horrors. To the Jews, it was a most ignominious form of death, making of Christ a figure of disrepute, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That's why they wanted him crucified. They wanted to sow the pips. They see, see, he should be disgraced. Our very scriptures say, He who hangeth on a tree is should be disgraced. And so that was one reason why they wanted the Romans to carry out the crucifixion. Verse 3, the phrase, none other nation would crucify their God. It is a sad distinction to be identified as the most wicked of nations on earth that had been identified as the most wicked of all creations. Thus the place was chosen in the midst of eternity where an infinite and eternal sacrifice would be made. To be most blessed precedes the fall to most cursed. History has so attested. That spirit which leadeth a nation to crucify their God finds its most obvious manifestation today among those who malign and persecute the Jews or those of any persuasion under the pretense of piety and loyalty to God. Verses 4 through 6, in rejecting Jesus as the promised Messiah, the nation of Israel rejected the testimony of angels, prophets, scriptures, miracles, mighty works, and the revelation of the gospel at the hands of God's own Son. If he was not the Messiah, well might we ask with the, honest, with the honest in heart of his day, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Yet all was, yet all was rejected, and Christ was mocked, scourged, and crucified. The nation to whom he went had blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts in sin. They had chosen darkness rather than light, and the prince of darkness rather than the author of light. All of this will come because of priestcrafts. Because of their iniquities, their scattering, cursing, scourging, desolations have all been prophesied. 
verses 7 through 9, the phrase, the scattering and gathering is first, fruit, is first spiritual. In that day, when the Jews accept Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah, they will become rightful heirs to the promise made to the fathers, including the promise they will be restored to the lands of their inheritance. Until they become again a covenant people, they have no claim on the ancient covenants. Jacob made it clear that iniquity leads, led to the scattering of the Jews. Similarly, he emphasized the order of the gathering. The Jews, he declared, will be gathered when the day cometh that they shall believe in Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConfie clarified the reasons the scattering and gathering of all the tribes of Israel are first spiritual and second physical. Quote, why was Israel scattered? The answer was clear. It is plain. Of it, there is no doubt. Our Israelite forebears were scattered because they rejected the gospel, defiled the priesthood, forsook the church, and departed from the kingdom. They were scattered because they turned from the Lord, worshipped false god, and walked in all the ways of the heathen nations. They were scattered because they forsook the Abrahamic covenant, trampled under their feet the holy ordinances, and rejected the Lord Jehovah, who is the Lord Jesus, of whom all the prophets testified. Israel was scattered for apostasy. What then is involved in the gathering of Israel? The gathering of Israel consists in believing and accepting and living in harmony with all that the Lord once offered his ancient chosen people. It consists of having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, of repenting of being baptized and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and of keeping the commandments of God. It consists of believing the gospel, joining the church, and coming into the kingdom. And it may also consist of assembling to an appropriate place or land of worship. End of quote. L. Russell M. Nelson emphasized the importance of the doctrine of gathering. Quote, This doctrine of gathering is one of the important teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Lord has declared, I give unto you a sign, that I shall gather in from the long dispersion my people, O house of Israel, and shall establish again among them my Zion. The coming forth of the Book of Mormon is a sign to the entire world that the Lord has commenced to gather Israel and fulfill covenants he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We not only teach this doctrine, but we participate in it. We do so as we help to gather the elect of the Lord on both sides of the veil. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained where the saints should gather. The revealed words speak of congregations of covenant people of the Lord in every nation, speaking every tongue among every people when the Lord comes again. The place of the gathering for the Mexican saints is in Mexico. The place for the gathering of the Guatemala saints is Guatemala. The gathering place for the, the place of gathering for the Brazilian saints is Brazil. And so it goes through the length and breadth of the whole earth. Every nation is the gathering place for its own people. Chapter 9, the phrase, the Gentiles shall be nursing fathers. See my commentary I did that includes First Nephi 21.6, where we talk about the Gentiles being nursing fathers and helping Israel being gathered again. 10 verses 10 through 16, the Lord will protect the Americas for the teachings of the gospel and establishing us his covenant. None that fight against him will prosper. Verse 11, the phrase, no king upon the land, meaning the Americas were destined in the province of the Lord to be a place of liberty, so that in them the gospel might be restored, and from them its saving message go forth to all the world. Such a destiny is facilitated by the absence of monarch governments, which usually have been synonymous with oppression and a lack of religious freedom. Christ is our king, and if Lehi prophesied, we serve him according to commandments which he hath given us, it shall be a land of liberty, which shall never know captivity, and in righteousness will we bless forever. Notice the conditions, if, brothers and sisters, right now our nation is not a land of righteousness. It is under captivity. It is not being blessed because we are not following the covenants that is placed upon this land. 
the pornography, the sexual immorality, the human trafficking, the abuse, all of the stuff that goes on in America. America is going to have to have the judgments of God placed upon it, just like all other nations that abused God's covenants and abused people. The America of the United States will face judgments because of the wickedness that now is being poured out in America. Chapter 10, verse 15, the phrase, secret works of darkness. Christ and Satan stand opposed to each other, one presiding in a kingdom of light whose mysteries we are all invited to know on conditions of righteousness. The other presiding in a kingdom of darkness where all have their secrets and iniquity reigns. The coming of the millennial kingdom, a kingdom of light, will by its very nature destroy that which is dark and evil. Verse 16, the phrase, whore of all the earth. Though there is but one Christ, there are hosts of faithful souls who with full authority can speak in the name of Christ. Similarly, there is but one church of Jesus Christ, yet there are hosts of congregations within that church. And so it is with the kingdom of darkness. There is one great whore of all the oaths spoken of by the revelator as Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. Yet she, referring to Satan, has numerous posterity posterity, for many have chosen to pattern themselves in her image and likeness. Thus we understand such phrases as the whore of all the earth, or the great and abominable, to which both a specific and a general, applica a general application. In this text, as in 1 Nephi 14.10, it is used in reference to the composite of all who fight against the kingdom of God. Verse 18, the phrase, I will afflict thy seed by the Gentiles. In his dream, Nephi saw a great host of Gentiles upon the land of promise. He then said, I beheld the wrath of God that was upon the seed of the brethren, of my brethren, and they were scattered before the Gentiles and were smitten. Jacob writes that after the seed of Lehi had been afflicted by the Gentiles, the Lord will soften the hearts of the Gentiles, and they will become as a father to the Lamanites. And at that time, many among the Gentiles will be touched by the Spirit and will be numbered among the house of Israel, meaning they will be brought into the church. Thus the land of the Americas has been consecrated, set apart by the Lord, to be a land choice above all others, to become a land upon which all men worship the true and living God. Which will happen, but the Americas will have to face its judgments because of its wickedness. Verse 19, consecrate this land. The word consecrate means to separate or make sacred. The Americas have been set apart or dedicated for sacred purposes. Palestine is known to have as the Holy Land, yet the land of America is no less so. And if judgment is made on the basis of histories of its people, the Americas perhaps have a more rightful claim to that honored name. Verse 21, Isles of the Sea. As Jacob pondered the scriptures on the tutelage of the Holy Ghost, he realized that Isaiah's reference to Israel being scattered upon the isles of the sea extended beyond that of Lehi's family coming to the new world. We know not how many righteous men like Nephi may have been directed by the Lord to take their family and migrate to various corners of the earth. But we do know that the gathering of Israel will involve virtually every land and isle upon the face of the earth. Verses 23 through 25. Jacob considered his remarks with cheer up and remember that all men are free to choose what they will reconcile themselves, that men are free to choose whether they reconcile themselves with God. President Russell M. Nelson gave the following insight on what one aspect of cheer up may mean. He said, My dear brothers and sisters, the joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. So perhaps when Christ says, cheer up, maybe he's saying, focus on me and know that all will be well in me. Have cheer in me. 
All must choose between the will of God and that of the devil, between the things of the spirit and the things of the flesh. He announced, after a reconciliation of their will with that of God's, Jacob reminded them that there still could be no salvation, save it were for the grace of God, in whom is found the power of resurrection through the atonement. In Romans 5, 1-2, we learn how we can access the grace of God. Quote, Quoting Romans 5, 1 through 2, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Thus, by faith in Christ, which is doing what God wants, how he wants it done, and when he wants it done, enables us to draw upon the grace of Christ, which is bestowed freely because of his love for those who seek him as their God. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching. I hope you gained enlightenment from the Spirit and were edified. If you enjoyed the presentation, please hit the like button.